Astrophysical models of the Sun indicate that the Sun was 25 to 30 percent weaker in Earth's early history than it is today. And this is because the Sun's interior is the site of an ongoing nuclear reaction that fuses the nuclei of hydrogen to form helium. This fusion causes the Sun to become brighter and larger over time, and it should have produced a very large climatic warming over the last 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. You might be thinking that perhaps the Earth was frozen in its early history when the Sun was weaker, and that is why it is not overheated today with a stronger Sun. Evidence, however, suggests that the Earth was not frozen in its early history. This evidence includes the prevalence of water deposited sedimentary rock throughout the Earth's early history. These types of rock indicate that the Earth's climate allowed for water in a liquid state. In addition, the evolution of species, the succession of ever more complex life forms, provides some proof against extreme hot or cold conditions. Here we examine the exchange or transfer of carbon between the Earth's sediment and rock reservoir and atmospheric reservoir in an effort to assess whether an increased amount of carbon in the Earth's early atmosphere might explain why the Earth wasn't frozen in its early history when there was such a weak sun. Carbon in the atmosphere combines readily with oxygen to form carbon dioxide which is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases trap outgoing infrared radiation emitted by the Earth's surface and re-radiates some of this heat back down to the Earth. This is known as the greenhouse effect and it further heats the Earth's surface. More carbon in the atmosphere results in a stronger greenhouse effect and a warmer climate. So more carbon in the Earth's atmosphere during its early history could have compensated for a faint young sun. Then maybe as the sun warmed over the last 4.6 billion years, this carbon could have moved or transferred into some other part of the Earth system, reducing the greenhouse effect and keeping the Earth from overheating. Let's take a closer look at carbon exchange between these reservoirs. We know that all of the Earth's reservoirs exchange carbon. Currently, small amounts of carbon exists in the atmosphere, in the surface ocean, and in vegetation, along with a slightly larger reservoir in soil, a much larger reservoir in the deep ocean, and an immensely large reservoir of carbon is stored in the sediment and rock reservoir. Carbon storage in these reservoirs is measured in billions of tons or gigatons. And the rates of carbon exchange among these reservoirs varies widely. But again, because all of the Earth's reservoirs exchange carbon with the atmosphere, each has the potential to alter the concentration of atmospheric CO2 and ultimately affect the Earth's climate through the greenhouse effect. The natural input of CO2 into the atmosphere from the rock reservoir is related to plate tectonics and volcanic degassing. That is a natural input of CO2 into the atmosphere from the sediment and rock reservoir. The major long-term process of CO2 removal from the atmosphere is tied to the chemical weathering of continental rocks. Now there are different types of chemical weathering. However, hydrolysis is the type of chemical weathering resulting in a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. In the process of hydrolysis, carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid. This acid can attack silicate rocks of the continental crust, 
right? So as this is rain, the carbonic acid interacts with the rocks of our continental crust. These rocks become chemically weathered or broken down. The most common rock comprising the Earth's continental crust is granite. And granite is a silica-rich igneous rock. There are many different types of granite containing many different types of silicate minerals. So we actually could have dozens of chemical equations here describing the process of hydrolysis. For simplicity, I'm going to use the silicate mineral wollastonite to represent continental rock in this equation. CaSiO3 wollastonite is used to represent our continental rock. Now when carbonic acid breaks down rock of the continental crust, part of the weathered rock is chemically converted to clay minerals in the soils and part is chemically converted to dissolved ions. These ions are carried by rivers to the oceans where many are incorporated in the shells of marine organisms. And the result is calcium carbonate, silica, and water. Both the calcium carbonate and the silica comprise the shells of many marine organisms. You can see by this chemical reaction that there is a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. The CO2 has been removed from the atmosphere and ultimately stored in the shells of marine organisms. After these marine organisms die, their shells settle to the ocean floor to become incorporated in the sediment, eventually undergoing compaction and cementation and transforming to rock. This process acts slowly but persistently over long intervals of geologic time, over millions of years. So in summary, the slow weathering of granite and other silicate rocks on the Earth's continental crust is the main way that CO2 is pulled out of the atmosphere over geologic timescales. Decades of laboratory experiments and many field studies have shown that the rate of chemical weathering is influenced by three environmental factors, temperature, precipitation, and vegetation. And these factors all act in a mutually reinforcing way to affect the intensity of chemical weathering. Specifically, the rate of hydrolysis increases with higher temperatures, increased precipitation, and increased vegetation cover. So the warmer the earth is, the more chemical weathering, in this case hydrolysis occurs, and the more weathering that occurs, the more CO2 is pulled out of the atmosphere, reducing the greenhouse effect and cooling the climate. Conversely, a cold earth, maybe an early earth with a very weak sun, would reduce the rate of chemical weathering. Slower weathering means more CO2 remains in the atmosphere and it ultimately means a stronger greenhouse effect to help warm a cool earth. Hydrolysis appears to be a plausible explanation as to why the earth wasn't frozen in its early history when the sun was very faint. And even though there is a fixed amount of carbon in the earth's system, we can see here that where this carbon resides in the Earth's system significantly influences Earth's climate. When carbon is moved into the atmosphere from any other reservoir, the greenhouse effect will strengthen and the Earth will warm. When carbon is moved out of the atmosphere and into any other reservoir, the greenhouse effect will weaken and the climate will cool.